This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by Adam Audio, Isotope, Native Instruments, Lewitt, and Grace Design. You're hearing my voice right now on the Lewitt PureTube microphone through the Grace Design M201 Mark II Mic Pre mixed through Isotope, RX, Ozone, Neutron, and Nectar, all on Atom Audio monitors. Please check out our awesome sponsors using the link in the show notes below. It's a great way to help support this show, and there's some great deals waiting for you there. Now get ready to rock. Something that happens a lot is whilst you're thinking about these EQ moves that you're going to do, is you're not giving your ear enough time to actually build in a a memory. Oftentimes I see people making EQ moves when the transport has stopped, pull out 200 hertz with a belt and not even listen to the result of that. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Look, if you're like me, then you love having cool instruments in your studio, right? No matter what style of music you make, Native Instruments gives your studio all the instruments and sounds you need. From drums, loops, and beats, to the coolest synthesizers, realistic strings, guitar amps, and futuristic synth pads. I love recording and tracking real bands in my studio, but then adding awesome overdubs from Contact, Massive X, Super 8, Battery, Guitar, rig and hybrid keys, for example. Use the code ROCK10 now to get 10% off or get complete start for free today with a bundle of 2,000 sounds and 6 gigs of samples all over at nativeinstruments.com. Are you recording your own music or other people's music in your studio, but you're having trouble figuring out how to get your mixes to sound great? Do they sound kind of weak or distant or lack punch and clarity? Well, I've got a gift to help you take your mixes from sounding like basement demos to sounding much closer to professional mixes. And it's my free course called Mix Master Bundle. This course will show you how to get pro sounding mixes from your home studio with free and stock plugins in Pro Tools, and the best part is that these mixing techniques work for you in any DAW, whether you're on Logic, Cubase, Studio One, Reaper, anything you can think of. If you're ready now to make your best record ever, then go to MixMasterBundle.com to get started for free now, and you can find the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. Howdy, Rockstars. It's your host, Lid Sean. Welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is joining us once again on the podcast, Sarah Carter, a BBC-trained mixing engineer based in Leicester in the UK. Sarah started recording and mixing music as a hobby in the mid-90s and then later turned it into a full-time career after studying audio engineering at the SAE Institute in London and working as a sound engineer for the BBC. Sarah learned her trade at the BBC's Made Avail Studios by working under the mentorship of some of the best engineers in the business. During this time, Sarah worked with a wide variety of artists such as Adele, the Black Keys, and Rod Stewart, to name just a few. And more recently, she focuses on helping home studio musicians mix music at home through her training courses, coaching sessions, and YouTube channel, Simply Mixing. If you enjoy this interview, please check out our earlier episodes as well, RSR 204 and RSR 377, when we talked about Sarah's background in music and shared some great home studio mixing tips. Today, we're going to focus more on how to EQ everything and then get into (laughs) some compression talk as well. Um, A thank you and a shout out to my brother from another podcast, Matt Boudreau at Working Class Audio for making our original introduction. I'll just keep thanking you forever, Matt. Please welcome Sarah Carter back to Recording Studio Rockstar. Sarah, are you ready to rock again? 
I am ready to rock again. It is very nice to have you back <laughs> joining us. I guess it's it's like morning time here, but it's afternoon where you are. So thanks to the wonders yes. of technology, we can see you and hear you yes. and sound great. All that good stuff. I know. It's amazing. What a wonderful thing. So what is a typical day like for you? Now, you're joining us from your studio. Um, obviously, you've made a lot of records in all sorts of places. You do a lot of mixing mm. out of your studio, um, uh, depending on what chapter of your your music career you're in. And you're also teaching and, and doing video production, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, a, a typical day for me um, uh, seems to center at the moment, center around coaching. So I've really uh, moved into that and embraced that side of uh, what was available to me with my you know, my uh, knowledge and starting to share it on YouTube, the coaching kind of came along. Yeah. How, um, what, I, I, what, I was, what was sort of a beginning of the coaching experience for you? Was there a moment where you got your first chance to do a little teaching of what you had learned and you, you just realized <laughs> that you really enjoyed it? Yeah. Yeah. It was just people reaching out, just sending me emails and saying, you know, do you offer coaching? And I'd never really thought about it before. And uh, I just thought, well, yeah, why not? Initially it was, well, what would that look like? You know, but uh, it, just like everything, um, you may not have all the answers at the beginning, but once you start, it all kind of, it happens, it falls into place and then you develop a routine. And before you know it, you're booked up. <laughs> and um, you know, having having a lot of fun talking to people that just want to make their are making their own music at home, and just want to make it better. Want to get as close to pro that pro sound as they can, and I've really enjoyed the the process of that. I didn't think I, I it uh, totally surprised me. Um, yeah, uh, but um, it, it's it's been really enjoyable. So you were mixing and and making music and then did you start um making videos as an extension of like this is probably a um a sensible way to be seen for the mixing work that I'm doing and things like that and is that when people yeah. sort of started asking questions and discovering and wanting to know more Yeah that's right I think uh I, um, if you go back to the beginning and look at my first videos, they may have been more targeted towards musicians and um, uh, maybe bands looking to get gigs and that type of thing. So th that was fine. And, and I was certainly producing uh, material for that market, how to get signed, that kind of thing. And then... Um, I kind of realized that I'd never actually done that myself, never been part of a band, not a serious band, where you're going out and you're, you're gigging and you're, you're looking for work. And so I didn't really have the knowledge mm. to be able to come up with that sort of stuff. And I just thought, well, why don't I just talk about what I do know and see what happens? And that um, then obviously started to attract an entirely different audience. Yeah. Well, what is your instrument when you do play music? Guitar. guitar okay cool yeah i did dabble for a while in bass and i really enjoyed that and then um i had a kitchen accident <laughs> and and took the very end oh. the very tip of my my little finger oh, off no. and now any time i fret a string using that pinky you, li you literally uh, i get fret. a shooting pain you fret with your face <laughs> at the same time you're like oh I fret. no, no. <laughs> That yeah. actually happened to my uncle, uh, different. He was, um, wor he had an old model, a car and he was poking around one day and his finger mm. got caught in the, the belt and it took, a, took off the yes. tip and it, it affected oh. his guitar playing for the rest of his life. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that being told at a very young age by my, uh, father who was an electrical engineer. I remember him, um, Saying, I, I saying, Sarah, asked him, by the way, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> I said that a lot, but no, I think I asked him why he didn't wear rings or something. And he's, and he, that was the very thing that he said that, um, 
because of the work he does, it could get caught in a, oh, in a right. fan belt or in, in, in machinery and take his finger off. So he never wore rings. Yeah, that, yeah that's uh, interesting. But, yeah, I've heard people say, yeah. I mean, we're going on a real tangent here, but I've heard people say, oh, no. you know, if you want to be safe, you wear steel toed boots. And then other places say yes. never, ever wear steel toed boots because if something falls on on the tip of your yeah. foot, it's going to cut your toes off. Eesh, eek. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So rock stars, the takeaway there, of course, is be careful. Because you're gonna, yeah, you're gonna need your fingers and your ears and probably your eyeballs to make music. Yeah, and your toes, maybe if you're a keyboard player, maybe or guitarist, you need your right. toes. Right. Otherwise, how are you gonna stomp on the the distortion pedal? Uh, yeah, distortion pedal. I know. Um, or tune your tuner on. You're probably not doing that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so tell us, um, tell us a little bit more about the kinds of videos you you started making. Once you figured out how to share the knowledge that you really um, felt good about, yeah, that that was kind of interesting. Um, I did a lot of research into how to make um, good videos, or how to create a successful YouTube channel, and so there's an awful lot of advice out there, and uh, it was. A case, basically, make your videos nice, short and snappy, to the point. Um, know who your audience is. Uh, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, and um, I, I tried that. I really, I really tried that. But I found that it was so time consuming because it meant that I had to sit down and write a script before every video. And... Um, I'm not very good at talking around bullet points, things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, I, I, so I had to script it out word for word. And so it just turned into this really <laughs> long-winded chore for me to make these short, snappy videos for yeah. people. And so all the time was at the front end. I was kind of, you know, creating the script and, and what have you. Um, but what sort of dawned on me was that, that that everybody was doing that. And so I just thought I'd take a risk and just press record and see what happens and just record, just uh, have a topic in mind. And then uh, obviously with, uh, with the, the topic that I teach, usually you have to have some sort of example or, or you know, a Pro Tools session open to yeah, show an example. Yeah. So it was just having a session open and a rough outline of where, of what you wanted to include, what you wanted to talk about and, and see what happens. And that ended up in being on average, me recording a, vid, a, a video that's kind of an hour long. Well, it's interesting. And having It's to, interesting to, having uh, to, edit to hear it. you describe that because it brings to mind a few things. One is the idea of zagging when everybody's zigging, you know, it's just like if everybody's yeah. going this way, maybe it's smart to just go the other way. And for me, um, yeah. I, I don't know, This pod, starting this podcast was maybe a little bit of that. I mean, it, at that point, not every, nobody I knew was really doing any podcasting. So it just seemed like, hey, this is something I could do. I need to talk about making records. Um, so, so pivoting like you described. But then also when you talked about learning which part of creating you feel comfortable in, like... There's, there's ways to do things where you could write out every word you're going to say, and that becomes a script. There's other ways where you, as you described, you make bullet points to yourself and then you speak mm -hmm. naturally about it. And it just reminds me that like that applies to making music, what kind of song chart works for you. If you're going to go play a live show yeah, or if you're yeah. going to play in the studio yeah. or whether you like to keep it in your head. And then also really in mixing, you know, like there's like, you could learn step-by-step -step ways to mix. You could learn some basic ideas and then just use them however you want, you know, all that kind of stuff. Mm. So anyway, yeah. do continue, yeah. please. But it just, I just wanted to say <laughs> it, it all really kind of connects. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I just, what the, the problem was that that more structured approach for me, because it was such a nightmare, uh, uh, it was stopping me actually making videos. So at some point I just decided that 
uh, I've just got to just got to sit down and record and see what comes out of my mouth and see if anything of see if any of it is retrievable and editable into a video. Yeah. And um, the great thing about that that I've discovered, and it's probably you know if, I think my channel's been kind of around for about three years now, so I think it's only been really the last year maybe that I've been doing toying with this idea. The great thing about it is what happens naturally is that I am able to, in the moment, voice my reasons for doing a particular thing in a particular way. Yeah. And I'm also able to voice what it is I'm hearing and therefore the reason I've taken the decision to do the thing that I've just done. So that seems to have really connected with people. And uh, I'm really excited about that and really pleased about that because this way of making videos for me is really fun. It's not so much fun at the back end when I'm trying to edit it all together. Right. <laughs> um, so uh, the, the other aspect of that is uh, that I can tend to go off on tangents and I, I it's funny, I, go, I think I go off and ramble and just talk about all sorts of unnecessary things and repeat myself a lot um but yeah I get feedback maybe it's that's what I edit edit out so the feedback I get is that they people like the way that I present things so simply and so um succinctly and that makes me chuckle every time Why? because you feel like you you which I've edited right. out all the rambly <laughs> rubbish <laughs> so um I'm trying to think like what do you ever think about that process of teaching the mixing and then how that same process might actually be part applied to mixing itself? Is um, that a fair question? Like in what ways in mixing can we just let our own natural voice come out a little bit more and then just delete all the stuff that didn't work and, you know, I consolidate. think it's maybe uh, that, uh, problem where people are can start second guessing themselves or or get overwhelmed, yeah, and in thinking about what they could do next or should do next. Obviously, it depends on a person's level of experience, but I guess it's more particular to uh, beginners or people with not that much experience, where they've you know they've been on YouTube, that damn YouTube. And they've seen they've seen the tutorials, and they've they've just got all these different ways coming at them to achieve a certain outcome that uh, they just end up getting paralysed and stuck with uh, with what they think they should be do, doing, rather than just doing something and moving on. And that's been a message that I've really tried to get across in my videos and in any teaching that I do, is just to make a decision and move on. A lot of what I talk about is centred around decision-making and choice. And uh, I think that by limiting choice and making decisions, uh, making you're able to make decisions faster and uh, you can then keep moving through the mix and get to, a, get to the end, basically. Uh, w without that overwhelm and without that cycle of going round and round in circles and not knowing what you should be doing next. And so, yeah, just having the bravery to just make a decision. Yeah, that sounds great. I'll, let's move on to something else. Because <laughs> when you move on to that other thing, that's going to affect what you did to the original thing. Yeah. 30 minutes ago, because that's mixing, that's sound colliding together to create outcomes uh, that are sent to our ears. And every move you make has an impact on every other move you make. So yeah, you might as like, well just make a decision and get on with it. It's like the, um, the easiest way to make a decision and move on is knowing, well, I'm going to have to come back and do it over anyway. So just <laughs> let's keep going, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And that, that really is such an important part of creation um, 
I remember, I, I've, I've told this story in the podcast before, but when I was in architecture school and they were teaching us painting class and they sent us home and they said, okay, you know, do a still life in your room or whatever with, with colored paints. And, and first we had to sketch out the outline of all the stuff, you know, I don't know what I had crumpled up stuff, pieces of paper and other things. <laughs> I sketched out the whole thing and then I went home. And I painted and I completely finished one part of it, Mm -hmm. just like soloing the kick drum or the snare drum for hours. You know, I just completely tried to finish that one thing. And then I was going to move to the next part. And somebody else came in and they had roughly put in the colors for everything. And the teacher made a big point of that. And the, Mm -hmm. the teacher was like, look, when you're painting, you want to you want to push all the colors of everything all at the same time. If you try and get one thing perfect and then move to the next thing, you're just going to literally like paint yourself into a corner where none of it ever works out and it doesn't make any sense. Um, And I, I still remember that years later when doing music and records, it's like, it's the same concept. It's like in producing the music and mixing if you try and just get one detail perfect and then go to the next thing and try and get that perfect, you get to the end and it doesn't make any sense, right? Yeah, yeah. I heard something recently or uh, the last uh, 12 months or so where it, I can't remember exactly how it goes, but it's something like uh, when talking about completing a task or anything, 70% uh, completed is perfect and 100% no, hang on. What is it? 70% perfect. Let's get this right. <laughs> do it, do 70% do it, do it, do it, yeah. is 70% perfect. perfect. perfection is perfect. <laughs> 100% perfection is not. Something like that. It's, yeah, I really yeah. butchered that. But no, the but idea, it makes sense, you know, right? Yeah. And we probably got it 70% right just now, didn't we? <laughs> and therefore it's perfect. <laughs> you nailed it. <laughs> I nailed it. Because <laughs> now we really get it. What does that even mean? I guess, yeah. you know, trying to it, do it 100% um, yeah. is painting yourself into a corner. And, and Yeah, it you know. just, the time it takes to, to get that thing 100% perfect. So you, here's, you here's, a, here's a way to think about that too, rock stars. Pick any record where you're like, that record is perfect. And if you went and asked the people who made it, they might yeah. very well tell you that they got it about 70% of what they really yeah, wanted. Yes, yeah. yes. I'd be curious what they'd say about, uh, you know, like Dark Side of the Moon. They'd probably like, ah, oh, you know, it's pretty good. But. Yeah, it's not bad. Adam Audio's S-Series, crafted in Berlin, is a flagship line of reference monitors featuring five models from the compact S2V all the way up to the powerful S5H. The range builds on Adam Audio's iconic heritage with new technology for improved acoustic performance. With new woofers, redesigned waveguides, and a DSP engine, the S-Series ensures accurate frequency response, consistent dispersion, enhanced detail, and a forward-looking digital connectivity. Backed by a five-year guarantee, Atom Audio Monitors embody durability and professional sound for your studio at atomaudio.com. So let's see. So tell us about your studio now. I know that we've talked about it in the past, but I'm, I think it's been a minute since we had our last chat and I'm sure yeah. you've got some, some changes Mm. Describe to us your studio and what are you sitting in front of? What's this? What are your tools that you're surrounded by? They're probably not that much different from when we last spoke, but what has changed um, are my monitors. I now, I've got some, I went from two way monitors to three way monitors. Um, so now I have the Neumann KH310s, uh, which are which just sound great to me. Um, really focused mid-range, uh, defined low end, really, really good. Uh, so that was a major upgrade for my studio. Um, having come from, I, I had some old Focal, two-way Focals before Focals, that. Focals, yeah, yeah. Which are uh, great speakers as well. Yeah, yeah. Um but one of the major reasons I went for the Neumann was because uh, of the possibility of using their DSP and room correction, which 
although not built into the kit, the three tens, they are that is built into the subwoofer that you can buy separately. So I went and did an eBay scour and found one. Uh, That's so I cool. Do, I do have a sub in here now, and I use that to run the DSP and to do the room correction, which. Uh, if I am correct in thinking, actually takes into account the phase uh, delays that occur, time difference delays that occur uh, within your room, rather than only just putting a EQ curve across your output to make up for any kind of room uh, modes and such like. Yeah, it'll actually adjust the timing of yeah. the frequencies yeah. coming out of the subwoofer. And so you, you end up getting a really great focused bass sound in your seating position. So just basic, and a, with a very basic description for the rock stars who hear that, but they're like, wait, how does that work? Um, you set your speakers up carefully, and then you have mm -hmm. a microphone that you would set up in your mix position. Do you want to right. just kind of recap? Yeah. As you know, a little bit about what you did for something like that. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting because, um, again, it's one of those topics where you've got lots of advice on the internet on, on the correct way to do something. And I, in that situation, I always fall back on the manufacturer's instructions. And uh, so I went with the good old equilateral triangle and uh, meaning that you are sitting, the distance between your monitors is such that your seating position is the same distance, if that makes sense. Like you're the point, your you're head the, is the point of a triangle. That's and right. And the speakers are the other corners. That's correct. So, um, uh, so that was the basic kind of setup. But the other consideration was to get the speakers as close to the back or front wall as possible to right. eliminate any um, room, what's it called? Reflections interference off the walls. Yeah, interference, yeah, the, um, doodah. Well, there's, there's more, ba um, speakers get more of a bass boost the closer they are to a boundary like a wall or, yeah. or a corner. Bounce, speaker boundary interference response. That's what I was there trying to remember. SBIR. Spiff. SBIR. Yeah, <laughs> that thing. Uh, so, so that's, yeah, so I did that and, uh, that, that was kind of my first, um, uh, basic setup and positioned my desk. Uh, you're then able to position your, your studio desk be once you know where you're sitting. Yeah. And, um, and then the, that then introducing a subwoofer is a whole new ball game because that is so... Uh, you know, you've got to get that in the right place. So again, yeah. that was referring to the manufacturer's documentation. Let's, just, let's reiterate that too, Rockstars. The, a subwoofer can be helpful when mixing and, and you'll get a lot of mixed response. I mean, I've we've talked to people here who will say subwoofer, yes. I've talked to people who will say subwoofer, no. Yeah. And I just know that like many other things we do, like EQ, you can just as easily ruin what you're working on as get it right. Yeah. So that's where a subwoofer can be tricky too, is wanting to dial it in so that it's helping you make good choices as opposed to causing you to make wrong choices. Yes. Yeah, that's right. And what really, did you, what do you remember about um, some of the basics? First, you got to figure out where in the room it's going, right? Yes. Yeah. Figure out where in the room it's going to go. Now you can do that um, if you don't have guidance from your instructions from the speakers, uh, the speaker manufacturer. Uh, which Neumann are very comprehensive in their instructions. That's good. So I didn't really, I just thought, well, I'll go with what they recommend. But if you don't have that information or that position doesn't seem to be working in your space, then uh, you do this kind of technique where you, um, uh, you have to place the subwoofer onto the, your seat, your listening position, which you know because you've got your speakers, you've set your speakers a distance apart. Mine, for example, are a meter and a half apart. And I, therefore I'm sitting a meter and a half away from each one. Mm -hmm. So I'd have to put the, the subwoofer on my seat. Where you would be, the, where you I the would subwoofer be. temporarily. Yeah. 
And then this technique involves you crawling around the perimeter of your room to find, to listen to, whilst you're playing back music, to hear the, the, or find the spot where the sound uh, and bass response feels the most balanced. Oh, that's fascinating. That's so sometimes audio stuff is just so duh, you yeah. know, <laughs> like, like putting a mirror on the wall to see where can you see, where's the reflection? It's like, oh, if I can see the speaker, then I yeah. must be able to hear it bouncing. Yeah. And that's cool. So if the, if the low frequencies work well between those two locations, then you can switch just yourself switch for the speaker. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's uh, one technique. Was that one the of the sofa. ones that Neumann, you remember them saying as well? No, no. They were very specific, you know, German company. I think they're German. Yeah. German company, you know, very into the details. And uh, no, they had set measurements um, to place the subwoofer. Um, on the front wall, we, they, give you, they give you options, basically. But to um, measure the front of the subwoofer to be a third of the way into the towards the center of the room, if that makes sense. Interesting. So, so not perfectly centered between no, your speakers, but no, but that was like the worst bit. place. Yeah. They were, that's the worst place. I yeah. Think guess where mine lived for a long time. Right there, <laughs> right in the worst place you can put it. <laughs> well, you know, the that, corners are the worst place to put it. Well, actually, mine are in the corners now, but it's a oh. stereo. It's two subwoofers. Okay. And it's, you know, Carl's got some secret magic yes. that he does that yes. makes it all work. Yes. No, but no. it's just funny because like that, what you just described, putting it off center, it doesn't, like, that's the opposite of a duh moment. Like you'd think, sometimes you think, oh, it's got to be right in the middle. And then yeah. it turns out that might not be the right place for it. So that's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's where it is at the moment. And then once it's, it's in that position, um, I ran the uh, software, that, uh, the room correction software that uh, Neumann provide. And, and yeah. that will send sounds out of the speakers to and back into the microphone. Yeah. So that you can, the mic can measure it and then it hears like, okay, it's working, it's not working, and it makes adjustments. Uh, yeah, yeah. And having used the Sonarworks room correction, uh, yeah, for a number of years one. before the, before getting the Neumanns, there are f far fewer measurements that the Neumanns take than the Sonarworks does. Um, yeah, the Sonarworks is is an interesting one, and and it gets a lot of praise on the podcast. And I've used it successfully here too before I redid my studio with Carl, and um, and you sort of dance around with the microphone in different locations and stuff. Yeah. I made a whole video showing how I did it here. Uh, if you want to see that rock stars, that's on my YouTube channel as well. But the, um, it's fascinating. It's just very cool. I mean, it's sort of fascinating to try it out. Sometimes what's hard though, is when you do the things, then you think, and then you sit and listen, and you're like, well, how do I, do I know do I feel confident this is working? How do mm -hmm. I know if I feel like it's working? Did you find that for yourself? And did you figure anything out about how to say, kind of like doing a mix, you know what? That's pretty good. I'm going to move on. Yes. Was it a little bit like that? Or did you find a way to say this? I feel like I nailed it. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, once the room correction software did its thing and came up with a curve, it allows you then to manipulate that curve if you if you want to. So you can write changes into that. So at that point, I kind of fired up Apple Music and started to listen to music and mixes. Oh, and, and then you just sort of adjust it until you like how the music is sounding. Yeah. What I actually tried to do was match it closely to my headphones, my uh, the headphones I use for mix checks, mastering checks, uh, and, and sometimes mixing completely or mastering completely, depending on where I am. But I've got the Focal Clear Pros, mm -hmm. um, which are, were the first headphones that I bought. And believe you me, I've had many headphones. But they were the first headphones I bought that I mixed on and the mix actually translated. It actually sounded great everywhere else. And so I'm really reluctant to kind of give up those headphones now. And that was a, that's a, such a great moment 
to to discover that for yourself. Sarah, you're an absolute, you're, you're a consummate professional rock stars. I was trying to adjust my video while she was answering that question. It just kept <laughs> falling up and down and smashing and falling down. And I know internally she was cracking up. She just kept talking, but she was like, I can't look at Lidge. He's ridiculous What right is he now. doing? Just stop messing about. These are the things How we have rude. to go through to bring, to bring <laughs> this, this live like podcast to you. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that's very cool. So yeah, so so matching it to your headphones, I think that makes a lot mm. of sense, especially if you're trying to build an environment where you can feel um, confident. confident. I yeah. mean, I, I think there are times where you might say, I like the fact that my different monitor mm. setups give me a different perspective. Yeah. But I, and, but there's I'm, also like, there's, there's the element of um, flat headphones, you know, flat meaning accurate and then accurate... Um, mixing monitors where you think mm. I want these ones to be sort of a true representation. And then you, you know, you might decide, Oh, I want my little speaker or my jam box to be a real world representation yeah. or, or the car. You yeah. Know? And I, and I had that in mind very much when I was tweaking this curve, I, I wanted uh, that more emotive feeling from the monitors. I wanted to feel the bass. I wanted that excitement. So I didn't want, I didn't want it to, I didn't want to take away that element because that's what you can get from monitors. You can get that on headphones sometimes is, oftentimes is lacking unless you're spending thousands and thousands on headphones. Yeah, that's a Um, good point. I mean, if um, sometimes it's a tricky one. So sometimes what's technically accurate might not be as exciting. I mean, I did notice that when I, first tried out the sonar works on headphones is it changed the quality of my headphones Mm. what I was used to. And I had to re I had to pause for a minute and really think about it and and sort of decide, um, relearn it a little Mm. bit. So you will have to learn your speakers rock stars when you use correction software and get Mm. used to it. Um, I uh, like what Sarah said, where she just listened to music until she learned, okay, this is what, this is the sound. And I like this. Yes. Yeah. And, and the key is to play tracks that you know uh, inside and out and tracks you've been listening to for years. Yeah. Uh, so you can make that choice. You make that decision. Um, so all we get to listen to is old music. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, okay. Very cool. So you get all that stuff set up. Then what about some of the other tools that you use? I mean, are you mixing in Pro Tools typically? Mm-hmm. Are you using anything else? Um, what about your your sort of keyboard mouse world? Do you like mm. to use fader packs, all that kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah. I use Pro Tools to mix with. I use WaveLab to master in um, because I like that, my, the mindset shift that brings using a different DAW. And uh, that's worked very well for me. So WaveLab is for mastering duties when I, whenever I get asked to do that. Yeah. And then uh, in terms of controls, um, I've got the S1, the Avid S1, an eight fader um, controller, controlling device for Pro Tools that um, I really enjoy using that in the latter stages of mixing, in that those sort of automation stages of mixing. Mm-hmm. So you can Do really- you find, um, maybe we talked about this some last time, but I, I went through a little bit of a um, time with the S1, and then I got the Solid State Logic yes. um, UF8s, and I've been using those. But And they're all very cool. They all, all, the, they all do different cool things mm. pretty well. So w- have you found that you find the fader, just the fader and the ability to do the automation, like you're saying, as the most useful part. Do you sometimes use yeah. the S1 to control the plugins or EQs <laughs> or any of that kind of stuff? No, it is just literally the fader. Um, I think because the S1, I, I, I guess familiarity comes with using it and taking yeah. the time to learn it and explore its features. But I'm a big, I, I whether it's lazy or not, but I like it things to be to work intuitively Mm -hmm. and uh, I find when things are buried behind several button pushes and sort of kind of crazy 
kind of, I, I can't remember that stuff. I can't remember what button to press to change that thing to, if, so no. Yeah, unless short it becomes muscle memory, right? Yeah, yeah. Short answer, short answer to that question is, no, I'm just using it for the faders. Yeah, no, uh, I think that's a fair um, analogy and a thing for us to remember with everything in this studio. Like there's a lot of stuff that we have that can do a lot of things, but sometimes we find ourselves using the simplest thing it does. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. It doesn't have, we don't have to be complicated with what we do to make great records. Yeah. 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 Just uh, do if we want to be, we can, and that's fine too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I love, I love geeking about with gadgets and gear and, and all that stuff. So, and, uh, you know, I, Probably should learn to use the S1 and all its features to properly get its value. Um, being from the north of England, uh, spending money is not our uh, favorite thing to do. So um, that's funny. Uh, you know, when you do spend a significant amount of money, which the S1 is, uh, I, I feel as though I really should learn what all the buttons do to get the best value out of it. Hey, Rockstar, come on over here. I've got a secret to tell you. Want to know how I get a consistent sound mixing over a thousand hours of recording studio rock stars? Well, my secret is using Isotope RX Ozone Neutron and Nectar to make this podcast sound great. Right now, you are hearing RX Breath Control, D-Click, D-Clip, DS, D-Plosive, Voice Denoise, Ozone Multiband Compression, Neutron EQ, and Limiting, all from Isotope. Use the secret code ROCK10 to get 10% off over at isotope.com. Well, some of the things that I did enjoy about it is the Avid Control software. I could have that, I put that on a um, Kindle Fire over to my right. So I had this touch yeah. screen and I was trying to get it to where I could see the folder tracks there. And if I wanted to go look at the drums, I just would touch that and it would like spill out all the drums on the faders. And, you know, then you go back to the whole mix or something. And yeah. Honestly, I can't remember if I got all the way there. I got, yeah. I got pretty close with it and I did some stuff, but it, it's absolutely true. It's what you say. It takes a lot of time and dedication and effort to really dig deep into the features on some of the gear that we use. And um, so I try to remember to give myself, I'll just wait, you know, before I really have something strong to say about it, I was like, let me just put in all the time first. That's been my takeaway. You yeah. Know? But I agree with you. Just having the faders alone and not doing anything fancy has been great. Yeah. I really enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. Just for that, the, those when you write in an automation move using a fader, you see all those points that Pro Tools puts in, you know, as you move that fader minutely, um, all that is being recorded into. Pro Tools. And those little minute movements, just by using a fader, all build into that 3D-ness quality or that 3D quality of a mix. Uh, it may, they may seem like minuscule moves, and they are, but I think they go towards that depth aspect of mixes. Yeah. Um, and I don't do that on every track. I would save that for sort of vocals, obviously lead um lead guitar yeah I, any I, lead i find they're very useful on guitars and since instruments that need to say a, make a statement and then get back into the yes mix, yes really useful well so um i said at the beginning is that we we're going to talk about how to eq everything and <laughs> this is actually to me this is the beginning of that conversation because before you even get into eqs as plugins we're thinking about all the tracks in a session, which are essentially, you know, if you've arranged your song, you know, from low frequency instruments to high frequency instruments, that is the first level of EQ, isn't it? It's just mm -hmm. faders and yes. levels between tracks and stuff like that. So um, is that part of what you get into when you're teaching? You, do, mm. you, do you ever do just the, um, let's just focus on learning how to balance first? Yes. 
Yes, absolutely. Um, it's so important because of the way, you know, our ears work in a certain way depending on the loudness of the sound or frequency that's been sent to them, the Fletcher Munson curves and all that stuff. Um, and so it makes total sense that if, uh, let's say, a kick drum is is quieter in a mix or is further down, you've got it, you've got it pulled down in the mix compared to the other instruments, you, your ears aren't necessarily going to hear the lower frequencies of that kick drum. So that then in turn is going to impact your decisions around how you EQ that kick drum. Mm -hmm. So by disciplining yourself and taking the time to just get the beta levels in a workable spot, then that is all part of that uh, decision making or that that choice aspect I talked about earlier where um, you're lessening the choice just purely by getting the fader in the right right place. You know, you, if it's in the right place and the low end sounds good to you, then that choice has been taken away or that decision has been taken away. Uh, whereas if you had it low down in the mix, you might be thinking, hmm, I need to get an EQ plug in on this and start adding some 60 hertz or some 50 hertz to it. Right, but maybe you just needed to bring the level of the kick drum up more. Absolutely, absolutely. So it's so important to spend the time on that first initial fader balance um, so that you're not chasing your tail with EQ when you get to mixing for real, for proper. <laughs> um, and I just think doing that pay, uh, pays dividends, really. Uh, getting that static mix phase, as it's called or referred to sometimes, getting that nailed um, can have yeah. a significant impact in the the length of time you even spend on the whole mix. Yeah, there's there's uh, it's always a funny thing too. I mean, I, I've done records where I've worked on the song and done overdubs and then really worked hard on a mix, and then I've I remember. I learned this lesson early on and then I went, this is back when we used to have to print everything to a CD to go listen to it in the car, <laughs> which of course is not the earliest because before that it was printing to cassette. Cassette, yes. <laughs> but then I, you know, I go to the car and I pop a CD in and I listen to the rough mix that we had started with and I was like, holy crap, that sounds so much better than where we're at now, you know, on the song. And it, and so then I had to go back and, you know, tear everything down and restudy what did i do in the beginning why that why does this sound better than where i'm at now after i you know quote worked on everything yeah so that really is a, a very important lesson and um i think you're right i think getting a balance right makes a huge um amount of difference before you can do anything else also you know we said it but maybe i'll point it out all that talk about getting your speakers and your bass, uh, your subwoofer dialed in, that's the first step. Like if you can't hear what you're doing, yes, you're going to have a difficult time making those balance decisions. Now, I will say that the easiest place to hear what you're doing in most situations is probably the mid-range, yes. you know? And so you can um, lean on that when, when in doubt. Um, turn things down a little yes. bit, and maybe and, and just make some decisions based on mid range. You mean turn turn stuff. your monitoring down? Yeah, just do, don't yes. be so loud. <laughs> yes, just don't be so damn loud, people. <laughs> yeah, uh, that, that's not. I don't. I think that's meant that does get mentioned, but yeah. I, that is equally as important is to recognize how loud your your monitoring is. Yeah, because the louder something is, the more bass and the more treble you're going to hear. Fletcher and, and Munson, they're your two best friends, Rockstars. Yep. Yeah. Well, that and Sarah and me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed. Well, so those those studies are really fascinating to go look at too. I can't remember if all the studies I'm thinking of came from them, but the frequency response is the one that we think of that you're yeah. referring to, which is the Fletcher Munson curve. Yeah. As things are turned up louder, we hear more bass, we hear more treble. And so we're effectively mentally EQing by just simply turning the volume of everything up. Yeah, yeah. Which is also why something that's slightly louder than another sounds better to you. Yes. You know, it's partly that. So 
being aware of that, which of course then begs the question, the important question of, well, how loud is loud enough to know that you nailed it? Yeah. So what do you think about that? What Does that question make sense to you? And do you have any yeah. thoughts about that? Yeah, it does. And the the when you go looking for the answer on Tinternet, you'll find that uh, you often see the figure of 85 dB mm-hmm. banded about, which is fine. But that generally, I may be wrong, but that generally refers or has come up through historically through commercial studios. Commercial studios and their control rooms are usually significantly larger and obvious, and oftentimes uh, acoustically treated um, in such a way that they are, that's just not representative of how we who mix at home or in a home environment uh, are hearing or should be listening to our mixes. And so that, that 85 reference is talking about Here's a level you, it's, it's a suggested level for working at when you're mixing as a yes. engineer in a studio. Yes, because it's the sweet spot for the old Fletcher Munson and curves. That's supposedly the sweet spot for hearing. Right. Like Equal. louder than this and you get more bass and treble, quieter than this and you get less. Yeah, so this is yeah. a good middle ground kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Right. Which is, again, it's that whole like, you know. What is, you know, what's the answer you get on the internet, you know, or or whatever. So, and then the other part of this question, because of course we're making music, we're making art and we're people. And you began this conversation by talking about wanting to be emotive, the emotion Mm. in making music. Yes. And that's bottom line, right? Like, yeah, I I don't, when I go listen to record in music for fun, when I'm having a beer and dancing around the studio with my friends, I'm pretty sure none of us are thinking, I wonder if this is 85 decibels. Yes. Yes. I'm missing the fact that it's making you dance and making you nod your head or or tap your foot, which is the point, really. Yeah. Well, Um, and that's what I'm getting at, too, is like there's all these different human listening experiences. Like both mm -hmm. you and I have headphones on right now where you talk to each other. Um, If you go in the car... I mean, oh, yeah. like I'm, I might drive one day in the car and my favorite level for listening to music is nice and quiet and it's turned way down and I'm thinking, oh, it's so great. I can hear, I can hear some clarity in the bass and some clarity in the top end at this nice little level. And then the next day I'm just blowing my speakers up, turning up dubstep so yeah. loud that I'm like, <laughs> I think I might be hurting my car stereo right now. <laughs> yes. And like both of those are, are valid Legit. listening yeah. experiences. Yes. Yeah. Uh, because that louder, you, it's, uh, it really gets the heart pumping. It really gets the excitement flowing when we listen to music loudly. And I think it's because we just, you know, the bass levels come up for one. And, uh, you know, it starts to have an impact on the way we feel. And that's, uh, that's music. That's why we do it. That's why people love it. So part of that is then when you're thinking about um, adjusting levels of different instruments so that they balance properly with the whole Fletcher Munson curve in mind, you you sort of have to know, do I want this to feel balanced at the loud moment? Do I want this to feel balanced Mm -hmm. at the soft moment? Do I want it to feel balanced right in the middle? (laughs) I don't know if there's an, Go, an, you know, an exact balance. answer for that, but but those are things that are all relevant, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I guess for me, probably thinking about that would be to really consider the the pinnacle of the song, the loudest chorus, and I think work start there and work backwards. And you can get that right then work backwards through the rest of the of the mix um start with that and then then jump to your verses um, so now you've worked on a um Roxas, we have a playlist of sarah's music in the show notes so you can just scroll down and go click on this and listen to a bunch of these great great records she's done um you have stuff that runs from rock and roll punk rock um you've got stuff that sounds like california skater punk 
Yeah. You've got stuff that sounds like uh, strings, string arrangements, and, you know... Like TV music, film music, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, film music. You've got stuff that sounds like it's um, a nod to uh, Portishead, and it's got yeah. that quality. Um, and I've written... I'm, I've taken more specific notes, but I'm just sort of off the top of my head remembering this variety of sounds. Yeah. And have you found that all of those inform your your process a little differently? You like some music you think about that I'm gonna need to turn this up when I listen to this. Some music you think I'm gonna need to hear a lot of bass when I listen to this. Some music you just think I I listen a little bit more quietly or anything like that. Mm. Um probably no. I think what's more important really is maintaining I think your listening environment has to stay as unchanged <laughs> as possible. I think keeping that, because if that moves too much, then I think you can get lost and you can start making some um, some decisions that might get you into trouble. So we talked about 85 dBs a few minutes ago and um, that being the kind of recognised studio standard for listening to mixes but in the real world actually that is quite loud for a studio for a, a bedroom or a domestic room studio setup and so i i know that i i tend to mix more at about 78 dbs something like that which is more comfortable um and so i really only change my monitoring i've probably got three levels of monitoring that I use thinking about it now. I've got my kind of every day that 78 or 79 dB level where I'm just doing the um uh the 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 bulk of the mixing. But then I've got a slightly lower level, a quiet a much quieter level actually, where I it's it's much quieter than if you were having a conversation in the room. It, you would be comf- able to comfortably have a conversation in the room with this monitoring level that's, that's quite low. And I use that for setting vocals and for setting snare drum. Mm-hmm. And then when I want to feel the low end, when I want to hear the sub frequencies, I want to hear them exciting the room, then I'll go a couple of notches above. And that's probably when I'm reaching the 85 dB actually. But I can't listen to 85 dB prolonged periods of time. It's just too fatiguing for my ears. Yeah, right. It'll wear you out and then you're using up your your good work yes. energy. Yeah. yeah, that's it. When a lot of the times all we need to do is make a quick decision on... yes what's going on at but that, that, at that, that level. stays the same the studio level monitoring levels stay the same and all the regardless of what style of music i'm mixing um and what i do is i use reference tracks to help me keep within my perceived boundaries of that genre of music and how what I understand to be the key to that style of music. And then make those comparisons between the reference track and between my mix at the same level, uh, the same That's listening great. level. And then I can make the decision. <laughs> What do songwriters, music producers, DJs, EDM, TV, and film composers all have in common with you and me? We all need incredibly cool sounds that instantly transport the music we are creating to the style that we want. This is why Native Instruments is your ultimate toolkit with a massive library of sounds for your studio. Whether you want to create hip-hop, indie pop, classic rock, meditation music, pumping dance floor beats, or 
or full orchestral arrangements, Native Instruments Complete Bundle offers you everything you need, from drums, loops, and beats, to wild synths, ultra-realistic strings, and vintage electric bass, guitars, and keys. The list goes on and on. I personally love recording real bands in my studio and then adding cool drum samples, synths, and futuristic keys from Battery, Contact, Massive X, Guitar Rig, and Hybrid Keys, for example. Plus, it's a great way to make your production sound modern and unique. Use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off or get Complete Start for free today with a bundle of 2,000 sounds and 6 gigs of samples over at NativeInstruments.com. The S-Series by Adam Audio, crafted in Berlin, is a flagship line of reference monitors, blending advanced engineering and in-house design. With five models in various sizes and configurations, these monitors build on Adam Audio's iconic heritage while incorporating new technology for improved acoustic performance. The range includes the compact S2V with the 7-inch woofer, the three-way S3H with twin 7-inch woofers, the vertical S3V with a single 9-inch woofer, and the powerful S5H and S5V main monitors featuring a 12-inch woofer and exceeding 131 dB SPL per pair. Despite differences in size and power, all these models provide highly analytical sound for professional audio applications. The S-Series includes new woofers, mid-range drivers, redesigned waveguides, and a DSP engine for crossover optimization. The result is accurate frequency response, consistent dispersion, enhanced detail in bass and mid frequencies with wider frequency ranges, and forward-looking digital connectivity all in a durable design. The S-Series ensures longevity in your studio, backed with a five-year guarantee at adamaudio.com. Howdy, rock stars. We're back now for the jam session. Session. <laughs> and uh, my guest today is Sarah Carter, joining us from Leicester in the UK, from her home yes. studio. Sarah, are yes, you yes. ready to jam? I'm ready to jam. Excellent. Uh, we were talking about the power of reference tracks. Mm. Um, you know, and all this is in the context of knowing how to EQ everything, because again, balancing all these different instruments against each other is the first step in, in EQ before yeah. you start getting tweaky with the rest of it. Um, what does the reference track do and how do you, how do we go about setting up something like that? The reference track gives you goalposts to aim for. And what I mean by that is it gives you, you, you will know if you've gone too far or not far enough. Uh, the, 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 most common way to use a reference track would be to assess a track's, a track's uh, overall frequency response. So you can make an assessment about the highs and the lows, and then you can listen to your mix and decide if you need to do some work there or not. Or if the drums are, you know, punch through more or less. Yeah. You can use reference tracks for every, anything. Like you can, how to EQ anything or everything. Yeah. Um, a reference track will help you set your, uh, help you make those EQ decisions. And they'll also help you with your fader balance that we talked about a few minutes ago. So I think they're a, val they're a valuable tool to use to uh, decision making again. Everything it comes down for me, it comes down to decision making and choice when it, when it comes to mixing. So um, how do we actually mechanically go about using a reference track what um do mm. we do we work on our song and then take a break and then go listen to another song up in the house and then come back down to the studio and keep working on our song or is that not how a reference track works <laughs> uh the i suppose the key uh the rules around using a reference track would be to uh pick a reference track that's in the same style as the music you're mixing um, pick a reference track that, uh, if not in the same style, at least has the same instrumentation, roughly. Pick a reference track that you absolutely love the sound of, that you think sounds great no matter where you listen to it. 
um, and import that into your session somehow. And you can do it just by importing it as if it as a as a wave file, a stereo wave file, and bring it in onto its own track and solo between your mix and between the reference track. So uh, we should probably only, point out, we should probably point something out as we suggest that, right? Because if your output is going through some processing mm. as part of your mix setup, then we might want to be careful that the reference track doesn't also go through the stereo yes, compression absolutely. and the cue that we've set up or something, right? Yes. Because then, then it absolutely. wouldn't be much of a reference. No, that's right. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. It needs to be in pre your mix bus compression eq and all that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, some, somehow just like your mix leaves as a finished mix and goes to the speakers your reference track should somehow also just go to the speakers yeah. Yeah. unaffected so that you're really comparing apples to apples. Yeah. There's a really great plugin I use actually that takes all that all that problem away and that is uh, the metric AB plugin from Plugin Alliance. Yeah, I've been using that a bunch lately too. Yeah. Before that, I can't remember the name of the of the company, Sample something or other. Years ago, they had a similar thing. Sample loops um, or something. There's a, I'm mastering the mix. Uh, there was one called Reference that I used a bunch too. <gasps> yeah, I, I'm familiar with that one. No, it wasn't that I was thinking about, but that is equally as good. The point being that it just sits, it's a plugin and it sits on your mix bus. Yeah, and, and, and then another way that people do it sometimes is if you're printing your mix to a track in Pro yeah. Tools, then you yeah. could just put it on that track and then you kind of... Yes, that's that's how I always print mixes. So yes, you can have it um, on that print track and then you can switch your input selector to that track so that you can effectively switch between the reference and your mix just with... A click of one button. And that's really the key right there, isn't it? Um, yeah. That, that it's a, like my questions are, sometimes my questions are loaded questions, aren't they? <laughs> but, but, you know, the, the important takeaway, I think, is knowing that our sound memory is very short. Yes. Uh, we, we can train ourselves to really know what things sound like in a longer context. But generally speaking, it's very short. And so when we do comparisons, it can be very helpful to set it up in such a way that you can instantly compare from one thing to another. Yes. One, so that you're listening, okay, I flipped to this and the bass came up just a little bit and I hear that now. Yes. So do you think yeah. that's fair? I'm, that makes sense? Oh, absolutely. Because I, I know that my audio memory in that co context is very short. I, I have to, it has to be in instantaneous for me to be able to hear that difference, particularly the smaller the difference, <laughs> then uh, that that time has to be uh, as short as possible. And these plugins really facilitate that, um, uh, as does the input selector on, on the Pro Tools. But not only that, that time frame between listening to your mix and listening to the reference uh, is something to consider. Also, what you need to make sure is that your reference track is at the same loudness level as perceived loudness, I guess, as your mix is. Because we said it earlier in, in the podcast that something a mix is, that seems louder or a mix that is louder see, seems or can come across as a better sounding mix just because it's half a dB louder. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and really, um, that, that's one of the keys to using reference track, you must make sure they're level matched. Yeah. And the beauty of using a plugin like metric AB, um, which comes from, uh, one of the companies that's been a sponsor on the show, um, plugin Alliance, um, or as part of a part of a, actually they haven't, but, <laughs> but they're part <laughs> of the company isotope and, and native instruments now. Yes. And, um, and they make a ton of great plugins and the metric AB is one of them. And so when you load in these reference tracks, you can click on the button and it flips instantly from your reference track to the mix you're working on right in that moment. Yeah. And it also can do the level matching for you to make sure that it's in the ballpark. I don't know if it always nails it exactly when it does mm. the automatic balancing, but it gets it so close. I've never really had a problem with it. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine it's quite a tricky thing to do because... 
nine times out it? of ten, <laughs> yeah. you know. nine times out of ten, that reference track you're using has been mastered. Yeah. So uh, its perceived loudness could be quite different to its actual loudness. If you know, yeah. so I I imagine it's quite a tricky thing for a piece of software to do in a matter of a second or something, yeah. two and seconds. Who's doing the perceiving anyway? Is yeah. It for what a computer perceives or is it what I, yeah. What I what, perceive? Uh, yeah. But, um, uh, but, but again, getting right. it close enough that at least you can tell yeah. those differences. And, and there are, are different situations where that can be uh, like different experience. One, you could be working on a mix and you're referencing a different song or a different production that's in a similar genre. And it gives you mm -hmm. an idea. I also find it incredibly useful when I'm just simply trying to make another version of my own mix and mm -hmm. I load in the last version we did. So like, for example, yeah. you know, I'm, I've decided that I need more kick and more bass. And, and so I go do a save as in Pro Tools and now I'm making, you know, mix yeah. 5.3 or something like that. And then, but I, but I don't want to forget what did 5.2 sound like when the bass and the kick were just a little bit too low. Cause that's easy to do. Sometimes I hear yeah. it in the car and I'm like, bam, I know it needs this. And I come down to the studio yeah. and I start doing it and I'm immediately lost. Cause I'm like, well, did I do it too much now? I don't know. Yeah. You know so having yeah. that ability to listen quickly back to the other mix, that can be really useful too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I use it a lot in the, uh, reference in the, um, revision stage of mixing yeah. with, uh, with a client. So they will come back with revisions and I'll put my, you know, you know, mix 5.2 into, uh, the plugin into metric AB and then I'll do a save as and start working on mix 5.3. And then, yeah, same thing. Am I that the, the when the client says the snare feels too loud in the choruses and I can go in and drop it a little bit and then do the comparison like for like between the old mix and the new mix. I'm a little surprised so, that, that the DAW makers haven't already included that built into the yeah, system. It, it's just such a no-brainer. Yeah, it's actually, they may do it in Cubase. I don't use Cubase, but the reason I say that is because they do it in WaveLab. See, you can now you go. smart. Yeah, you can import reference to, you can import a track to uh, a, what they call a reference track. So, um, you shouldn't it, even have to import it. I mean, they're all in the bounces folder in Pro Tools. It should just automatically, you should just be able to automatically yeah. listen to something from the bounces folder. Yeah. Against yeah. what you're doing in that moment, you know? Mm. Um, yeah, maybe maybe one day there. Metric AB will let you have a like a folder, just point it to a folder and it'll just find the tracks there for you. Yeah, cool maybe. Yeah, it will do. I mean, you can point it to a folder and it will import all the tracks from one folder, but you have to do the clicking to make it do it. it, mm. do it okay, I haven't tried that yet. I need to try that. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So reference tracks are a great way to make sure that you're in the right ballpark. Um where do we go from there? What's what's the next stop in our journey to EQ everything? <laughs> um, that's a really good question. So we've got our balances. We've got a reference track. Yeah. We know we're in the ballpark. Yeah. And, then, and we've done it. We've spent time on the static mix, making sure our fader, our faders are in a good spot. Now I would uh, say that. Um, so so the next thing could be to put EQ on a track that might need it. I would venture, I would go so far as to say, you know what, just, just put an EQ plugin on everything before you get started and you can yeah. just have it turned off or just don't do any yeah. boosting or cutting. Yes. At least have it there ready and waiting for you. you know? Yes. <laughs> well, that's, you know, you're getting into template territory there then, aren't you really? And yeah. uh, having that sort of thing uh, there and switched off. So it's, it's, it's to hand. Yeah. I, t I tend to do that with channel strips. Um, yeah, I love the um, SSL channel strips. I use the UC1 controller from SSL now. Oh, uh, okay. And I find it just so great to have all that EQ right at my fingertips for yeah. when I need it. Yeah, that w that's, yeah, I miss that. You know, we talked earlier about the S1 and, and everything being under. The controllability, if that's a word, is there but it's behind button pushes. And I yeah. missed that uh, 
instantaneous uh, move that you could do when working on an actual console and just reach for the damn EQ and just and just turn it. That's and, really why I switched over to this SSL world because I because of that one feature. Just just the yeah. ability to have the I, channel strip right I, in front of me. Yeah, I I I'm very tempted to to actually give that a try. I think it was just the only thing that put me off was the is it's a Mackie is it Mackie um the way that it talks to pro tools is the yes. Mackie HUI human user, user interface or Huey Huey uh, yes. thing which is which is which is quite old yeah isn't it's it? an older format and and the limits to that format are just built into it but yeah. um we don't have to get too much on a tangent for that but SSL mm. is has taken that and said you know we're just going to create our own 360 yeah. software that will let us take this to the nth degree. And if you don't use Pro Tools, if you use UA Luna, for example, it ab they absolutely talk to it directly through, I forget what it's called. It's like a for a MIDI format. Okay. Advanced MIDI format and and Studio One and and I think Logic and stuff like that. So any of the other DAWs really do speak really well to all this stuff. Yeah. But um before we go, because there's there's so many slippery <laughs> slopes we could talk yeah. about in the studio. The, um, I like having the EQ in front of me so I can reach it and use my hands. And, and one of the first things I learn is to make bolder moves mm. more quickly, but I'm going to throw a caveat in there. One of the things that I really appreciate about your mixes, um, Sarah, and listening to the, the wide variety of stuff, it kind of reminds me of my interviews with Steve Albini where he has sort of a, a somewhat minimalistic approach to EQ. And he yeah. talks about how, you know, the more EQ you introduce into things, the more phase shifts and it starts yeah. to smear the sound in ways that can destroy a mix too. Yeah. Um, and, you know, again, there's no one size fits all in, in music because there's no one size fits all in art, you know? No. But but I do think there's a lot to be learned from that concept of um, uh, doing less with EQ more effectively, and I feel like your your records sound that way to me. So congrats! Oh, on that. nice. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's uh, yeah, that's good to hear. Thank you. <laughs> right. So, and the reason I say that is I might have these knobs in here, but it doesn't mean I need to turn them all like crazy. Yeah. You know, so I, I'll yeah. take it away again. I, I keep, you know, interjecting, but, <laughs> but what are your thoughts on that? Um, how do you like to approach EQ when you begin to, you know, you've got the balance and you're like, all right, what am I going to address next? It's really assessing the tracks. It's just listening and suppressing any urge you might have to just through muscle memory or whatever to just start twiddling knobs and twiddling away on an EQ. And you will get that because particularly beginners, because you don't know what you, I'm saying you don't know what you're listening for, but that's what is repeated to me time and time again. I don't, I did this, but I don't know what I was listening for. I don't know what I was listening for. I don't know if it's right or wrong. You tell me. So the first step is just to listen to what you have been given. Make a judgment call. Do you like it? Um, does it sound like you think it should sound? Does it work in the context of the mix? Does it work in context of the group? I work a lot in mixed groups. So what I mean by that is, you know, everybody bangs on about not working in solo or, we, uh, you know, make your moves within the context of the mix. And I think that is absolutely great advice. But I like to go a little bit but more focused than that to help me make mixing decisions, and that is to use my groups. So I will um, zoom out from the, that sort of initial soloed position on an instrument, let's say, uh, let's say a guitar. I'll be listening to a, a, a track that I've been given, solo it to have a listen to it in a very focused state. Do I like the sound of it? Is it too bright? Is it too harsh? Uh, is it quite uh, woolly sounding? Do I need to do some EQ to this? And then I will listen to it within the context of its 
musical group. And that is going to be obviously the guitars, bus or group bus, solo the bus, listen to all the guitars together. And then I will work within that group bus um, mix to blend my guitars, do fader balances, uh, get things to the right levels. And then I'll go to EQ and start to use EQ to fit them all together. Yeah, Um, that makes sense. So it's like you're thinking about the drums as a complete instrument, or even the guitars, yeah. you know? A lot yeah. of rock records, all the guitars work together as one big instrument. Yes. And that I'll, once I'm happy with the guitars, then I kind of think, well, what are these guitars going to have to fit with in this mix? Nine times out of ten, it's, well, hmm. Maybe six times out of ten, you're gonna have you're gonna have some keyboards. So then I'll solo the keyboard group and start working with the guitars and keyboards in context with one another. And I'm forever, rather than working in solo, I'm usually working in the context of a group or the mix as a whole. And I'm doing this zooming in, zooming out all the time to get these instruments to to fit together and to decide. Does it? Does this track actually need EQ? And I check myself because um, it's just so easy to do. Or you, particularly beginners, again, will think it's what they should do. Um, everything needs EQing, and not not everything does need EQing. It completely depends on how it's been recorded and and the microphones used, the way it's played. So don't fall into that trap. Um, it's like, you know, um, high passing everything. Uh, not everything needs high passing. Uh, it, but you know, maybe a lot does, but not everything. What, um, go ahead and explain what you mean by high pass and, um, do, Mm. do describe some places that, so if, if the first thing we learn is we don't know anything about EQ. Mm. Um, what is one of the first things we learn about the value of high passing? And then, you know, following that with, but don't over, don't over deliver on <laughs> don't value by high, high passing everything or else you'll have no body to the music. Yes. Yeah. So uh, high passing is uh, referring to the high pass filter that you see on every EQ plugin, pretty much. Which every is also- channel strip. It's kind of unfair, right, that it's named high pass because really when we think about yes. it, we think about it as a low cut, like we're removing some low end. I know, and that's something I've had to train myself to say instead of low cut. We, I, I think we would refer in Europe, we, uh, certainly the UK, I think tend to use low cut and high cut as the terms, low cut filter, high cut filter. And uh, I doing this work on YouTube and working with people all around the world, high pass seems to be the more frequently used term. So I've had to train myself. <laughs> it's like learning another language. It's like if, if English is your second language and you've kind of got to think of it in French yeah, first. Yeah. You think of it in French first and then you think, what what is it in English? So you've got that split second. I do that with I pass. Well, we've we've had, as I was telling you, we've got a French student who's been staying with us for a couple of weeks on an exchange program. And it's just so funny to rediscover all these quirks about English versus French and how the sayings, yes. you know, in one language you say this was, you're on something and another language it's in something, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's just crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so high pass. Um, so where are some of the first places to discover that a high pass can be quite valuable in a mix when we're learning? It would be in any, with any instrument that has a significant amount of, or potentially a significant amount of low frequencies to it. So you would think of a kick drum or you would think of a bass guitar, um, or a bass synth. And so we think about using a high pass filter to start to carve some of that off, uh, uh, exclude it from the track so that it will have the effect of, uh, obviously it will feel as though the track has got less bass, um, 
But that can be a good thing because too much base will start to cause havoc with any compression or compressors that you might want to use further down the line, particularly a mix bus compressor. So it's good practice to keep your low frequencies in order and in check by, and the first thing you would use to do that would be a high pass filter. So, and, so it's interesting. Yeah, it's counterintuitive because you might think that the, the high pass filter was useful for all the upper instruments that were not the bass and the kick, but really yeah. a good place to discover it is controlling yes. that low end. And, and yeah. when you talk about wreaking havoc, that's a good reminder too, because I think one of the early use cases for high pass filter was mechanical. It was literally like sort of created to make sure that sound could be cut effectively onto a disc with a lathe mm. or else it would screw up and it would jump the needle out and it wouldn't work right. Yes. And then, um, and then you talked about it, how it can affect the compressor and the mix bus. It can also affect the speakers, just speaker cones just yes. can't handle it. You know? Yes. Yeah. I just think that's a good reminder to us that there's a level of decisions that are pragmatic and mechanical and fundamental versus decisions that are artistic and musical and mm -hmm. arrangement wise. Yes. And sometimes we yeah, confuse ourselves really trying point. to think about both of those things at the same time. Yeah, that's a really good point. Cause you've got, you often hear of, uh, mixers, um, that will touch the cone, the, the speaker cone, won't they? To sort of check yeah. the level of the low end. Yeah. Uh, or just physically look at the speaker cone, see how it's moving. Yep. Um, as a, as a, a guide for that. Well, and, and when we talk about what kind of speaker cones, so particularly on an older um, sh uh, desk or a, a shelf, what do we call them shelf shelf speaker like bookshelf. an NS10 bookshelf. Book thank you, bookshelf yeah. speaker like an NS10, which yeah. were, which many mixes were done on, and you really see the cone moving on those, and yeah. especially if you don't have a subwoofer going. You know, you can't hear, I don't remember what frequencies they go down to. They do go down to low frequencies, but, you know, they roll off pretty quick and they really focus on the mids. But you can see the cones doing funny things. And yeah, the, um, like vibrating and yeah, flapping. The, what do they call it? The <laughs> dust cover or whatever. The, the, uh, that yeah. thing sort of bends in funny ways. Wow. And you'll, yeah. You'll, blow up your speakers. I've done it many times. Take yeah. them out during bass over tufts. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. yeah. So, so knowing those mechanical things, um, yes. modern speakers can be a little tricky because sometimes they, they have built in circuits and they are more protective. So it can yeah. be a little harder, but it still has an effect on the sound, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And um, yes, you, you're right as well. Uh, the more mid-range instruments or mid-range focused instruments, uh, start to listen to guitars or start to listen to synths where um, it doesn't necessarily have the bass content that a kick or a bass guitar would have, but it can still have an element of stuff going on down there that you don't really need. And oftentimes you can't isn't actually being reproduced, but there's still energy there and it's still energy that will move your speaker cone. Mm -hmm. And it's that energy builds up track by track by track by track and it builds up through the mix. So you may, you may not see it in solo or hear it in solo, but by the time you're playing your mix through your speakers, it's all layered up. And so using a high pass filter on the more mid range instruments, um, it can really help you out as well in that respect. So I think one of the things that's good to point out, I mean, we, we haven't really gotten into compression yet, um, and I don't know how deep we'll get into it, but just know, Rockstars, that as you build your mixes, you know, the first, I feel like the first thing I learned was to put a compressor on individual instruments um, and what kind of effect it might have on sound. Then I learned to put a compressor across the stereo bus and, you know, what ways that can affect the sound. And then I learned parallel compression and, you mm -hmm. know, bus compression and various things that all, you know, become a more co a potentially complex mix mm -hmm. template where um, a lot of 
bits of compression in different places add up. And in those yeah. instances, I think what I've realized is those very quiet, like what you described, like way down in their lower frequencies that are on instruments, which don't really, they're, they're not there that much. By the time you build up these complex mix templates, sometimes you're taking stuff and you're just rushing it to the foreground of your speakers, you know? And mm -hmm. so it really can start to, to show up and it really can make a big difference. It really does add up all those, yeah. all those tracks. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And usually uh, it's certainly an observation I've made with coaching. That's a really common issue um, is that sort of low mid clarity, Get, getting the lows to, to feel powerful, um, but tight in such a way that you can percept, you can hear the kick in its own space. You can hear the bass guitar complement it complementing it in its own space as well and uh oftentimes it's just not using the um high pass filter uh something i did dabble with or do try to more these days i just keep forgetting is to use a low shelf Instead rather of a than a uh, rear because of the phase um i i understand or understood that a low shelf, uh, sorry, a, a high pass filter introduces more phase shift. Yeah. It can introduce uh, distortion too, can it? Yeah. Upper yeah. frequency harmonic stuff. And these are yeah. all, these, these can all be subtle things that are hard to pick up on at first, but when you yeah. start experimenting with them and again, like all the, the whole mix coming together and the final loud version, you know, after mastering and all that kind of stuff, you really start to note this really shows a lot yeah. more. I am massively impressed with Isotope Ozone. I've been mastering a lot of my records recently, and Ozone makes it so easy for me to get a fantastic sound. The mastering assistant will help you get started by measuring your track and suggesting all the settings you need for a professional result based on the genre and EQ curve of your choice. You can even reference a specific song if you want. Using simple yet sophisticated modules like Clarity, Impact, Low End Focus, Stabilizer, Imager, Exciter, and Spectral Shaping, along with powerful dynamic EQ, compression, and limiting, you simply adjust the settings to your own taste and it sounds incredible. And the magic of master rebalance means you can reach into your mix at the mastering stage and manipulate the vocal, bass, and drums. My bandmates are pretty demanding of my mixes, but now when I send off the masters for approval and get comments back like, holy bleep, pristine, damn good mastering, crystal clear, you're a wizard, finally I love my singing, and the drums and bass sound huge, well, then I know I'm doing something right. So check out the newest Ozone, RX, and all the other great apps at isotope.com and use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off. Okay, so then you mentioned a good word. You said the power in the mix. So is that a place where we can mess ourselves up when we, when we, st when we discover high-pass filters and we think i'm gonna put this everywhere <laughs> yes you can end up with anemic mixes um that just uh lack power yeah because you've shaved off uh too much in the low lower frequency areas of, of each track so um that's where it just comes back to listening to what you've been given making an assessment go to a reference track Listen to uh, that mix of the band that you love, that you've been listening to for the last decade or so, and do a comparison um, and decide whether you, how much you can use your iPass filter just by comparing it. And sometimes it can be in your journey, traveling around music on what, whatever platform you listen to music on these days. You can hear a track and these things can be isolated. So many times you'll hear a kick drum, just a, just a raw 
drum kit start is in the intro of a track. Um, and you're able to hear these instruments in isolation at the start or in the middle or at the end of a commercial track so that you can be even better informed uh, when you're making your comparison between your mix and your reference track. Yeah, assuming they didn't completely change the drums once the band kicks in, you know. Yes. Sometimes they'll do that trick say, too. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say that. But be aware that, uh, yeah, once the band kicks in, there could be some serious automation coming in too. Yeah, so, so Rockstars, what we're referring to is <laughs> um, an advanced EQ automation trick would be to have a setting that works when all the instruments are playing together in the verse of the song or the intro or the loud chorus. But then when those drums were isolated, sometimes the mixer might say, oh, the drums sound too thin. So now we're going to, you know, change the EQ settings in the mix and stuff. So it can fool yeah. you. Or, you know, a classic move when the drums are isolated or when the bridge comes in or things like that is just cranking up the room mics more, you know, changing the balance yes. of all the drums too. Yes. Because that yes. it, that's one of the reasons why sometimes you sound check drums in a recording session and you're like, ah, oh, these sound so great by themselves. And then once the once you start recording the whole band, you're, really, you're like, ah, oh, we got to turn all those room mics down, you know, yeah, yeah, and stuff because you just want more clarity and punch from the individual yeah. drums. Yeah. Um, cool. All right. So, Oh, I think a thing to mention too, when you, we talk about a uh, low shelf versus a high pass is also being aware rock stars, get familiar with what the different high pass slopes feel like. So the slope is how, what's the angle of that line that, you know, that is cutting off the low end? Is it very steep? Does it have a little boost just before it cuts down? Or is, does it roll off gently at, you know, 6 dBs per octave? Mm. Um, 3 dB per octave, I don't even know if that's really a <laughs> high pass, is it? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. No. But a very gentle high pass is interesting. You could, for a, I, I found like on an acoustic guitar, for example, if you have a 6 dB per octave high pass, you can move the frequency that it starts rolling off at much higher and, and you don't hear it. It doesn't sound yeah. the same. You just have to like hear all these different curves with your ear and you begin to associate them with a feeling really kind yes. of like, oh, that's yes. what that kind of does yeah. to it. Yeah, that's right. Because oftentimes you'll, um, I, I'm guilty of it, will say, oh, uh, yes, I will use a 60 hertz uh, high pass filter on bass. And I'm not giving the context of the actual slope that I'm using as well. So 12 dB or uh, 6 yeah. dB or 24 yeah, what, dB. What is that? SSL's whatever. default is 12 dB or something or 18? Yeah, something I'm, like I'm not, don't know. I was going to make that point actually that that is when, you know, I love using all the analog emulations and that's why they all sound different. Not only that because of the, the way that they were built and the electronics inside them, but the, the curves that they use um, to, uh, manipulate the, the frequencies with, uh, but you don't see that on them. You know, you do when you look yeah, at you a think about Pultec, it, a you don't see it. It's just, yeah, that's it. But that, that's a factor why they sound different to each other. Um, it's one of the things I love about the SSL, for example, is that you have, um, you know, some, some mixing desks. I remember the first one I had was a Mackie, you know, an actual. Yeah. Yeah. And I it just had off. a button. You just hit the, the button Behringer. and it, it rolls off a hundred Hertz and it's very yeah. useful, um, in a lot of situations because, you know, a hundred, a hundred and below is kind of where most of the low end of a, of a song feels and where the bass is happening and things like that. Yeah. But I think it's it also up there really quickly. Yeah, I think those were also sometimes designed to pair well with a PA system mm. and the way a PA would function, you know, effectively. Yeah. But with the SSL plugin and with with um, many filters, now you have an adjustable knob so you can listen and adjust it, you know, uh, adjust the frequency and move it from from no high pass, move it slowly up to frequency until you feel like you're hearing it. Yeah. And um. And it's tricky to do, you know, if you're in a 
What What are your thoughts about being able to hear that high pass and make the right choice? Because I've, I now have low end in my studio where I can hear the effects it does. Mm. But um, a lot of times, you know, you spend a lot of time with small speakers or bedroom studios and you you might not hear it yeah. until it hits 100 hertz and starts going up from there. Yeah, I, I, I think it's, if you can't, you can't EQ something you can't hear. Um, so it's really tricky to do if you've got smaller, smaller monitors that are, that are rolling off at 45 hertz or something like that. Yeah, um, but what you can do is something you did bring up already, which is you can adjust the level of the bass in the mix until it sounds like it's yeah. in a good spot. Yeah, go to, go to your fader balance again. Yeah, I, and yeah, that that's true. Uh, again, that's something that I've, I've seen on mixers where going to the kick drum, where you have a kick in and a kick out or a kick sub, uh, that it's just that lower capture is too high in the mix. It doesn't need EQ in, it just needs the fader bringing down. I see that a lot. Um, I think sometimes people think that they should all be at the same level, you know, the, the mics that make up the kick drum sound uh, should all be at the same level. And that's, you know, that's what you're supposed to do, but but it's not. You, you're supposed to blend them in to taste and uh, make your decision as best you can with what you've got. But yeah, it is tricky. If you can't hear that low end, my temptation is just to leave it and let the mastering engineer deal with it. Yeah. Um, uh, Focus on but, balance. Focus on the stuff that you can hear. Yeah. When you can't yeah. hear stuff that you that you can't. Yeah. Yeah. Because I even with my studio now, even with all this low end in here, I still find myself like looking it's almost like there's a there's a there's almost like a motivation to look for stuff we can't quite hear and work really hard on it in yes. making records yes. it's funny you know yeah um, i think there's i think there's no harm in in that situation i think there's no harm in using high pass filters very conservatively yeah so uh you know 40 hertz 30 hertz something like that yeah if, uh I'm always, I don't know why it comes into my mind, but I always think about these car systems that are out there with subwoofers nowadays. Uh, very, very popular. Yeah. And if, if, you, if you've got lots of stuff happening at 30 hertz and below, you're just going to blow the car doors off. So I think um, uh, using a, a high pass filter at conservative levels, 30 hertz, 35, 40 hertz, I think is kind of a, uh, could be regarded as housekeeping and not going to get you into too much trouble. Now, now another good, I think another helpful tip, rock stars. Um, you know, Sarah, I know in your videos, um, you talk about listening and training your ear to think which what EQ frequency might I need to address before you start doing it. Sometimes, and in yeah. that process of training ourselves and learning where the frequencies are. One of the tricks that I do sometimes in the car where I think one day I was like, well, what the hell frequencies are these? You know, like I'm going to go adjust the bass back in the studio because there's a delay between yeah. listening in the car and then going back into the studio to make a move. And of course, when you're in the studio, well, it sounds different again, you know, yeah, you're yeah. not in the car. So in, in trying to decide, well, how, how can I tell myself where these things are that I'm hearing right now? Um, I just realized I was like, well, wait a minute, I got this frequency app, you know, a tone generator app. You can just download it to your phone where I'm streaming the mix from my phone to the car anyway. Mm. And you can just sort of like sweep the frequencies around and listen to your car speakers mm -hmm. to hear the mm -hmm. different tones. And then you're like, oh, that's 30 hertz. And like, oh, that's 70. That's where the bass is. And I thought it was lower and stuff. Yeah. yeah. So that can be really handy. And, and then again, doing the same thing even in your studio. I need to do that again in the studio, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, one of the things you can discover when you sweep a frequency slowly and, and really listen in your studio is you might notice that it sounds like it gets quieter and louder while you're sweeping the frequency. <laughs> yeah. And you might even notice, this will really throw you off, like as you go up into the mid-range frequencies too, and then you and you hear a tone and then just move your head slightly to the right or slightly yes. to the left. And you're like, 
oh man, it just went away. It dipped and came back yeah. again. <laughs> yeah. Or turn your head and you start realizing what you're up against, you know? Yes. Yes. You can only do the best you can do at that where, you know, where you're sat at that yeah. point in time. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's mixing and EQing music. It's a moving target. Is yes, all we're trying that's to what do is just, gonna... We're trying to hold a moving target still for long enough to make art. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. I just keep going back to reference tracks, really. Um, yeah. Even that scenario going out to the car, play the reference track in the car as well. Yep. Yeah. Um, I wish there was an instant reference track app for the car because that's one thing Yeah. that I don't quite have. Um, yes. One possibility, Rockstars, for doing that would be um, Samply is a great tool for uploading your mixes and then playing them back off of a player in the car or wherever, and it plays yeah. at a high quality. So you could, you know, if you have a copy of these reference tracks downloaded, you could, um, you can easily load them into Samply and make them all uh, playlists. Yes, level a, match them. Yeah, they don't call oh. them playlists, they call them versions. Okay. Um, in one song and then just flip between them pretty, pretty quickly. It's not instantaneous um, unless your internet's really, really fast, but mm. that is a pretty close way to listen to things sort of like compared comparatively. Um, yeah. And it does, unfortunately, because of iPhone limitations, it doesn't do the level matching when you play it from an iPhone. But if iPhone uh, does get that correct, then... Uh, Sampley will be ready for him, and, and, and you do get to like level match between things, which is cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, I know we've been going for a long stretch, but let's let's uh, let's touch a little bit more on next places to look for EQ. So we we learned the power of the um, high pass. What's a next destination for that you feel like where where it's most valuable in teaching places to learn EQ? Mm, gosh. Do you think, um, do you mix with a, with a um, sort of a smiley face EQ on the stereo bus or do you think that's like, yeah, that's way down the line something? Yeah, I, I don't, I have a, uh, an EQ, there is an EQ on my mix bus ready to do that, but that's something that I tend to do later on in the mix. Um, once I've got everything working together and I've EQ'd, I've EQ'd at track level, I've EQ'd uh, possibly at group level as well. And, uh, and it, it's really more in the latter stages of the mix that I'll go and then start using a reference to, to make a, 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 a call about how my mix is comparing just, yeah, high end and low end and to see whether it's dark sounding or whether I've got the low end is, is a bit too energetic, then I can use, or if it's gone, or if it's gone the other way and it's just a bit, a little bit. Um, so that uh, sounds like that's, yeah, that's definitely down the road a bit. So now here yeah, we are, yeah. let's just say we're, we're soloing the drum group because we've allowed ourselves that luxury. We said, well, let's, we can at least solo the drums as a whole and see what they're mm -hmm. doing. Now we've got all these things within the drums and we think, well, which one needs EQ? Which one should I do mm -hmm. something to? Yeah. I, I have a thought if I, th that I'll share with you. And I'd be curious if you feel like this is a, a helpful way to determine that. Because sometimes you're like, well, I can't solo it. So how do I know if it's doing something? I mean, I guess a couple of options are, let's just say you think the snare needs help, the snare mic, but you're not sure if you're hearing it you're not even sure if it's the snare mic that's the one that needs the thing, you know? Mm, mm -hmm. Do you think it's fair for the the options to be um, the f one quick option that I always think we always forget about, like the first EQ we get uh, is the fader, but actually before that is the mute button. Yeah. Because you can just mute any of yeah. the mics, mute it in and out and just listen to your whole drum mix, right? And just say yeah. like, Wow, did that make the cymbals better or worse? Did that make the snare better or worse? Yeah. Because sometimes you can be surprised. You mute a snare mic and you're like, oh shit, I'm, that didn't even really change the sound of the snare. <laughs> like I'm not hearing <laughs> yeah. it. I'm not hearing yeah. the snare through the it's snare all, mic. Oh, it's all in the overheads. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I use that technique all the time, that muting, to uh, determine 
whether I've got the level correct or whether the thing I'm doing is actually the having an doing. effect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so that's, uh, that's really a, a large part of that whole decision-making process is muting something to see if you notice a difference and whether that difference is helping you or hurting you. Yeah. Do you ever feel like the time that you've spent watching YouTube videos, trying out mix tricks and tweaking version after version of your mixes has gotten you nowhere? Have you been looking for a simple, straightforward, step-by-step process for creating a pro mix that won't take you years to learn? What if you could have a Grammy-winning mix engineer who understood all your mixing struggles and could coach you through them? If you struggle with any of these questions, then the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass is just for you. Now you can discover the proven step-by-step mix system from Grammy-winning mixer Craig Alvin for consistently creating a pro-quality mix from your home studio that will sound amazing everywhere. Listen to this quote from one of our students, David, quote, absolutely the most informative and helpful block of information and mentoring on the mix process that I've ever been a part of. That was like sitting behind a mix engineer for years, watching and picking up tips along along the way, but condensed into a six to seven hour session, close quote. Look, I'm so confident that this will take your mixes to the next level, that if you can't get a killer mix within 30 days, I'll give you a full refund, no questions asked. So if you're ready to take your mixes to Grammy winning quality, then go to ultimatemixingmasterclass.com and start now by checking out the free preview of the ultimate snare mixing trick. And I'll see you at the front row table of the Grammys. Cheers. The opposite of a mute is an extreme turning down. It's like it's, it's an on off. It's, it's a binary. On-off. This is turning it's, it down a ton mm. <laughs> all the way. So yes. then the opposite would be turning it up a ton. So yeah. if you we already did that with the fader balance. So we don't need to take the snare fader and crank it all the way up. Although we could adjust it a little bit more, but the but now with the EQ, do you find if we're thinking maybe it's a 250 hertz or maybe we're thinking it's mm. a 2.5 kilohertz or something, that that it's okay to take that frequency and just turn it way up to see what it does? Certainly. If that's it, you can do that. You can take, you can pull it way down to see if that takes away. If it, it, you know, it depends whether you are thinking something needs enhancing or whether something needs correcting. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you could certainly do that. And and if you were using, uh, well, I guess it doesn't really matter because you can often do that on a lot of channel strips where you can switch the EQ. In and out. Uh, in and out. Yeah. Not, oh, not the whole EQ, but sometimes just one band. Yes. And so that's, you can, that's really helpful if you're doing something that you think maybe is a subtle move and you're not sure if it's making the difference, but switching it on and off so you can hear it mm. there with and without might really help you feel confident about the subtle move. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think something that happens a lot is if, whilst you're make, thinking about these EQ moves that you you. Uh, you're going to do is you're not giving your ear enough time to actually build in a a memory, an audio memory. So oftentimes I see people making EQ moves when the transport has stopped. (laughs) So um, they will just pull out 200 hertz with a bell to, you know, whatever, two, three, four dBs and not even listen to the result of that. So they've not listened to the before, the during or the after. And uh, I think that's something to bear in mind to make sure that you, I just don't understand how people can make that decision without hearing what they're doing. Do you find um, that there are, I know some plugins will have an A and a B setting or an A, B, C, mm, D setting. I think some of the, many of the plugin alliance ones do that too. Mm, um, do you find that that's a smart way of working where you can 
set four different EQ approaches? Because I mean, sometimes you listen to the snare and you're like, this with this band, should I be cutting some low mids or should I be boosting some upper mids? Or yeah. should I be? And sometimes it's amazing the diff you can cut a frequency and that sounds pretty good. And then you can alternatively completely boost that frequency. And sometimes that sounds good. And they're yeah, like, you just, and they feel it. like different artistic choices. That's it. That's exactly what it is. Um, it's, uh, it is an artistic choice. It comes down to taste. So that's what art is. Uh, that's being creative. And that's you, that's your decision to make. Which one do you prefer the sound of? Um, and whether, it, de it depends how you're approaching making this decision. Is it an artistic choice or is it coming from a place of, is this right or is this wrong? I, and I think that's a really hard call to make um, when you're working in such a subjective uh, field as we do. Uh, and so certain things are most definitely wrong. For example, something being out of phase and you losing the low end completely. Um, but other times it's just changing it in some way, changing how it sounds. And then it comes down to you to decide whether you whether it's something you like or you don't like, whether it fits the style of music, whether it uh, is, uh, you know, what's intended by the recording artist. You may not be the recording artist. You may be mixing somebody else's song. Yeah. In which case you would be well advised to get a, ref, a rough mix from your yeah. art, artist to help you make that decision and also get a reference track suggestion from them. Yeah, how that they rough want mix, mix is so sound. valuable. Mm -hmm. Even your own rough mix is incredibly valuable. And then mm -hmm. you talk about checking against the reference, especially for losing the body of a track. Yeah. I find the rough mix super helpful because the rough mix didn't have all this crazy shit on it. And yeah. So yeah. If there was body it's in there. And if you accidentally killed a good thing, <laughs> if yeah. you accidentally killed your baby, you're going to yeah. find out when you flip back and listen to that rough mix. And yeah. You're like, Oops. It's that before scenario, isn't it? Yeah. The, the yeah. rough mix. You, if you could just do it, take a print of your rough mix before you do anything yeah. to it. Not all weight loss prog, uh, <laughs> programs are a good idea when it comes yeah. to making records. <laughs> um, okay. So, and then that just reminded me, we were talking about the ABCD buttons. Um, yeah. So those, it's just as a reminder, Rockstars, a lot of plugins will let you do a setting and then you save it to the A and then you can change the settings and try something different and save it to B so you can flip quickly between A and B. And it just reminded me that I need to use those more and yeah. we probably all need to use this more. And remember when we were talking about um, EQ tricks where like maybe the th drums changed in the drum breakdown versus the rest of the song. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes like I hear the, it, we talk about automating settings within plugins across the song. And Sometimes I think about that. And I'm like, well, theoretically that sounds cool, but what a pain in the ass to have to like <laughs> write automation for the EQ balance and Q curve yeah. and location yeah. and all this stuff. And I'm just remembering, it's like, no, you just do two different settings for two different sections. And all you yeah. have to do with automation is click on the A or the B and to yeah. instantly change. So that's just a good reminder for us, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I don't use those buttons enough either. There you go. Let's all use the buttons better. Let's yeah. Be better button pushers. Better. <laughs> yeah. um, do you have anything you want to share before we finish up about um, EQ and vocal? Obviously, vocals are pretty important because a lot of times that's mm. the people who are singing themselves making their own music. And uh, yeah. no matter yeah. what's going on with the rest of the music, if we don't like our own voice, we're not going to like this thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that when it comes to EQing your own voice, I think putting a lot of effort, time and effort into making sure that you, you're happy with the recording raw, if you know what I mean. So get the tuning done if, if you feel as though you need it. So it's, so it's all great from that, um, respect. Then 
uh, make sure, just make your decisions as best you can within the context of the mix. If you find that too confusing, um, take the drums and bass out and just make some decisions using, you know, guitars and keyboards or just keyboards so that you can um, at least keep some context and then start to bring in the other instruments and see whether that still works or whether you still need to do a little bit more. That's a um, great, great bit of advice. Um, do you mind if I add to that? No. So, so that's something? that's great. And immediately I'm remembering all the times where I built up this whole band mix and then try and add in the vocals at the very end. Mm. And they just just die in the track because everything else is so loud and in your face. And it's like yeah. there's no room left for the vocals. And then and then it feels like the only move for the vocals is to keep turning up the knob, <laughs> the input knob on the distressor, you know, these compressors. <laughs> yeah. You're just destroying the sound of the vocals yeah. to try them to try and get them to be like more distorted guitar than the distorted guitars, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, yes. and and what you just reminded me of is this concept that your vocals in a lot of situations might be competing with like the drums and the bass. I know I just said guitars as a reference, but they might just be competing with some core instruments and the drums and the bass, which want to be pretty loud, could be it, um, especially in the the body of the vocal, right? Could be yeah, competing with yeah. the bass. And so allowing yourself to mute those instruments and listen to the vocal so that you feel confident that at least you're starting with a good sounding vocal. Yeah. Yeah. A tool that really helps right at the outset is a, it, I found is a multiband compressor just to even out the tones yeah. of, of a vocal. Um, so oftentimes that can be the first plugin that will go on. Will, will go on just, just to, just to catch any kind of pokey frequencies, mm -hmm. just to level them all out and, and only have, uh, what, four bands or something. So not, yeah. uh, you know, not cr crazy, not six or seven or eight bands, just three or four, just to keep things tucked in and just have a gentle rippling kind of movement with the, um, you can see it. Uh, happening in real time, can't you? And so and it's a form of EQ because the bands are mm. EQ, so they're controlling. You know, they're, yes. they're they're catching the lumpy frequencies when they happen. Yeah. They're catching the harshness when it happens, and even the yeah. deassing. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's just as a really nice job of um, <laughs> uh, of smoothing out the vocal. Um, I think I've used the term of making the vo making the vocal sort of a more more vanilla in tone. <laughs> Good vanilla, um, like like yeah, fresh yeah. natural vanilla bean. Yes, yes. The ice cream with the specks in it. Yes, yes, the real stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, just, yeah. just then you've got just a level. It just levels things out, that lumpiness out, like you say, and then you can start to build on that. Um, and then maybe you need to initially you'll need to go in with a with a. I was going to say a low cut, but initially you need to go in with a high pass, uh, and, and you know take that up to the point where, you know, again, make that decision in the context of the mix though. Yeah. Take that low cut all the way up so you can actually hear that it's doing something to the vocal and then bring it back a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so that, and then mute that, that cut that you just made, mute that low cut, to switch it off and switch it back on, on again and see if you can hear the, hear a difference. And if, difference is uh doing good things then obviously keep it uh, if it's but you'll soon hear that you've gone too far doing that yeah. and then you can start it's to almost it back. it's almost easier to hear if it's doing bad things and they just keep put backing it up yeah so i want to i want to add something to the multiband compression um because rockstars i know i know what you're feeling when you put that on sometimes you're like i don't know is this doing it is this doing a thing is this not doing a thing that's a golden opportunity to take some of the buttons and settings and knobs and crank them all the way so that you can <laughs> train yourself. What, ha what does this thing do? So a great way 
for, to experience that in multiband compression is, you know, take a mid-range band and just bring the threshold way down, all the way down, just squash it and then go like, oh, that's how, now I hear it sounding really weird when it's doing too much in that frequency yeah. band. Yeah. And, you know, try that with the different bands, compress it a lot because it, what's tricky about making some of these right moves when you put it on and it's the correct setting is again, it gets into subtle territory. Yeah. Yeah. Where you can be like, I, I think it's doing the thing. And that might actually be just right. And you can build your confidence up by like really killing it. And then yeah. going like, okay, that, like I hear that. I know what that sounds like. I know that yeah. sounds wrong. And then back it off until you get into a zone where you're like, okay, it's not killing it. And yeah. you might be in the right spot, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, you'll find as well that, um, at least I've found that when you're working with plugins, you know, from Waves or from FabFilter, that they set these things up in the default position where it's not going to get you into trouble. So right. um, you can just put it on set yourself three or four bands and uh, the only thing you really need to touch is the threshold on right. each band. Yeah. And uh, don't worry, don't get bogged down in all the other settings. There's a lot of settings in there. There's a lot of settings. <laughs> because it's like each, each band that you create is, has got its own individual compressor on it, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So um, and, and don't worry about that ratio, attack and release or anything like that. Just play with the threshold initially. Uh, oh, and to be I, honest, I hardly touch those controls anyway. This podcast is proud to present Recording Studio Rockstars Academy. Are you ready to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level and make your best record ever? Then visit the Academy to find the course that's right for you. Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Then check out Rockstars of Drums to learn how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a professional Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Or if you're ready to start mastering your own records at home, then check out Rockstars of Mastering, where I walk you through exactly how I master my own records using nothing but plugins. Plus, I take you into a world-class mastering studio, Sterling Sound, to meet with Ryan Smith and hear how he professionally mastered my record, Skadoosh, for release to streaming platforms. That's the music you hear on this podcast, Rockstars. And if mixing is your focus, then check out my free mixing course, Mix Master Bundle, where I show you how to mix using stock and free free plugins and Pro Tools. Plus, you get a look at how I recorded everything in my studio and multi-track downloads for you to practice mixing and even upload to your website if you want. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash academy to get started now. So I just wanted to add to that, that um, since we don't have enough time to dive deep into compression here, um, Sarah has some compression videos on YouTube on your channel. Yeah. Is that correct, Sarah? Yes. Yeah. So that so that would be a next stop for you if you want to like, well, okay, I do want to understand a little more about those settings on a compressor. Um, yes. Maybe we can uh, drop a link in the show notes to, yeah, to your videos absolutely. for that. So that you, but but please be able to, if you go into them expecting snappy <laughs> six minute videos, uh they're not going to be snappy six minute videos. They're uh me doing a deep dive basically into, uh, you know, compressing snare, compressing kick drum and what attack and a release does and, um, nice. you know, pre prepare for 30, 40 minutes of me blathering on. Well, that um, sounds good. Well, the nice thing is your voice <laughs> sounds so great that uh, we're, we're quite happy to listen to you talk. So. <laughs> Fortunately um, for me, yeah. Awesome. Well, I think we're, I think we've covered a lot of great territory here. Um, just to re recap, I mean, Rockstar's the idea of beginning with balance in the faders because the first the first step of EQ is, you know, just balancing these instruments against each other and then all the mics that go into a drum set, you know, and seeing how it all adds up. And then, you know, uh, the concept of mute button being a powerful EQ because you can just mute something and find out what happened to the frequencies in the song yeah. when I muted it, you know? Yeah. That'll One tell thing you we didn't... Lot. We didn't mention panning, so that obviously then... Oh, yeah. Tell went, us tell us what you wanted to say about panning then. Yeah, well, once you've kind of done that fade of balance and everything is usually still in mono, unless um, it's your drum overheads or something. 
Um, but once you've got that fear to balance and then you start to pan things, then that is going to have an impact on the fear to balance because things are going to start to be perceived at a different level depending on how far wide you've got things panned. Um, mm -hmm. And you're also moving them in the stereo field. So, you, so you're creating some space around that part as well. And that's also going to have an impact on your EQ in decisions. Um, so panning is equally as important um, to consider in those early stages before you start jumping to your EQ plugins. Yeah, good point. Yep, yep. Positioning in the stereo field. And, you know, I, I think there's different ways to think about it. I think one is you think about when things are in mono and they're coming from the same location, the frequencies are on top of each other, and that's yeah. fair. And when you pan it out, the frequencies, you know, maybe sort of aren't on top of each other and they're still coming out of two speakers, you know? Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. But I think that um, remembering that our perception of sound is still always a very legitimate perspective on what's going on. And so if our brain interprets an instrument slightly differently just because it's coming in one ear more than the other, um, forget the rest of the science. That That's relevant, you know? Our brain... Yeah notices a sound because it's over on the left or over on the right or in the center. Mm. So I, yeah. so I just, uh, I don't know if that makes sense. What I just said, it's just that sometimes it's good for us to really think about the physics behind it. And sometimes it's good for us to just think about, well, what does my brain think? Yeah. How do I want it to sound? Yeah. Um, Cause that's what counts. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sarah, uh, thank you for being on the show with us again. This has been a total blast to hang out with you and yeah. dig in. And I know there's so much more to talk about, but Rockstars, please um, know that Sarah's got lots more teaching over um, in her world. And where are they going to go to find all that out? Mm, yes. Um, the best place to go is probably... Uh, my Simply Mixing website, uh, so www.simplymixing.com, and that's where you'll find uh, training from me, free, uh, I've got a free drum, drum workshop at the moment. Uh, hopefully it's still there when, um, when this podcast goes out. Um, but uh, I've got a, I've actually got a static mix course that you'll find there, which is covering a lot of what we've talked about today, about fader balance and panning and um, taking the time to make sure that they are correct before awesome. diving into the good stuff. But um, then the next place would be YouTube. Obviously, my YouTube channel is called Simply Mixing. Stick that in the search bar, you should find me. And I've got a whole bunch of videos going into EQ, how to hear EQ. So talking about the decision making and, and uh, simplifying things so yeah. that those decisions are easier for you to make. And then, um, uh, then there's my actual kind of mixing business website, which is www.musicmixpro.co.uk. And then, you know, I, I'm on Instagram. You'll find me on in Instagram and uh, Facebook. Okay, groovy. Well. And we'll, sure. we have links to all this in the show notes too, Rockstar. So you can just scroll down, click any yes. one of them, go check them out. And then um, also don't forget, uh, go listen to the records that Sarah is making because we're all listeners first. And so we know when stuff sounds good. And when you hear that, you're going to be like, Okay, <laughs> this is a good place to learn. So, um, Sarah, let me let me ask you our closing question again, which we've done before. We'll do it again. Mm -hmm. This is our hypothetical question where we get to take the way back studio machine and you go back in time and, just <laughs> jip, 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 jip. and um, maybe you're teaching yourself some mixing advice, um, but you find younger Sarah and yeah. you say, "Listen, I've um, come back to give you this one bit of advice." Here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. What advice do you want to go back and give yourself if you could? If I could, it would probably be to trust your first instinct. Yeah. When making making decisions. So and and 
uh, really sort of honour that moment and be aware of it that it's happening. So that will be when you first press play to listen to a mix. Um, it will be when you come back the following morning after you've been mixing uh, the previous day and night, coming back with fresh ears and that first press of the play button and know how, recognise how important that is in feeding into your perspective and decision-making process. So, yeah, uh, use your first instinct. Don't squander that moment. What a good word. I don't know if anybody has said squander yet on the podcast. What a great <laughs> word to go out on. Yes. Sarah, it's a pleasure <laughs> as always to hang out with you. Your voice, um, I'm trying to remember, is this a good word? Mellifluous? Is that is that the positive word or is that the, not the positive word? I think it is, right? I know. I think it's like, it's it's sonorous. <laughs> it's like musical sounding. So it's it's uh, no. always a pleasure to hear you uh, talk and to have you on the show, and you got such great a great style of teaching and a technique, and um, I think that one of the reasons why peop- your videos are doing so well when you talk is because you just you you clearly have a patience in your process. Oh uh, yeah, that quite, I'm sometimes yeah. lacking. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so rock stars thank you for listening sarah thank you thank for joining you. us again and can't wait to run into you in person hopefully we'll see you over on this side of the pond at nam or aes yeah, or something like great. that if i don't see you over there first yeah that would be wonderful but yeah thanks lidge it's been an absolute uh, pleasure sarah thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you soon cheers Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rock star i'm lid shaw and this is recording studio rock stars now go make great music recording studio rock stars would like to give a big thank you to our amazing sponsors who helped make this episode possible lewitt grace design adam audio native instruments and isotope And remember, at isotope.com and nativeinstruments.com, use the coupon code ROCK10 for 10% off any plug-in purchase. If you enjoyed recording Studio Rockstars, then please check out our sponsors using the links in our show notes below because it's a great way to help support this show. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio because they're going to help you make your best record ever. I would also like to thank our fantastic team here at Recording Studio Rockstars, Vlad Wesselchenko, Braden Streming and Liz Hulitskaya. Thanks so much for listening, Rockstars, and we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.